All right. So I'm, as promised, 404 is our typical start time. So I am going to get us um, going uh, now. Um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, this event is being recorded and it's our last uh, Photo Fika meeting of 2020, um, which is just crazy. Um, crazy that we have been through a year of this, uh, almost a year of this. Crazy um, to think um, that 2020 is, is nearing its conclusion. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Anne Masoni and I'm the Dean of the School at the International Center of Photography and welcome. Uh, I want to start by thanking the Society for Photographic Education, who we remain affiliated with and who has been generous enough to let us use their Zoom account. SPE is a member-based organization, for those of you who aren't familiar, and we'll be dropping their website in the chat window momentarily. A few protocol reminders. Um, again, just for those of you who are new to us, um, we do um, have an email blast that we send out uh, in advance of every meeting. Um, and please direct uh, message to me your um, email address and I'll be sure to add you. Otherwise, we do all of our updates on social media posts as well. Uh, we do ask that you stay in mute um, uh, during the presentations and then we'll open up the um, meeting to the larger audience once we've completed uh, those presentations um, and we welcome uh, conversation at that point. Once we do wrap up the presentations, do stick around. Uh, it's always an informal conversation and we um, would love to have you present your questions. Um, please do use the chat feature. I'll remind you all of that um, when we get to that point, um, but it helps us to make sure that questions are being answered and if they're not, be able to do some research and get back to you. Um, we, uh, I say this every week, I will continue to say this every week, um, we are establishing the way to move forward in this time to do that together. Uh, so welcome all back to Photofica. Betsy, over to you. Hi, um, I'm Betsy Schneider uh, and I'm having technical difficulties on my end. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, so I am, I, I probably, it always feels weird introducing myself. I'm a uh, founder of the ASU Online Digital Photography BFA program, and I am a faculty affiliate at Emerson College. Uh, so I have my hands in several several dimensions of, of teaching photography in this era. Um, my colleague, uh, Jonathan, and... Um, <clears throat> What can I say about him? Uh, like he's got a lot of energy. Uh, he's been a fantastic colleague so far. He came in circumstances of of like kind of running right into uh, a global pandemic, uh, and uh, I'm really excited to hear about and and I've I've been hearing about the adaptations that he's been making in the classroom specifically, and he was already doing that in advance of COVID because he was using kind of hybrid teaching styles and. And uh, I think what I'll do is just pass it to Jonathan so that we don't use up all this time. Great, thank you. Uh, thanks for having me, everyone. Um, I'll, I'll try and make this really casual. So if anyone just has questions as I'm, as I'm talking, you can uh, interrupt me or you can write stuff in the chat. Um, can I also get sharing permission, by the way, too, from, from my screen, do I already have them? Okay. Um, so it's gonna be a bit crazy just because I have a lot of stuff on here. As, as John was, was saying, so I am, uh, his colleague, I am an assistant professor in, in photography and, and digital futures, and this is not a shameless plug. I just, it so happens that I'm, today I'm just going to be running through some of the Instagram posts that I um, posted earlier today uh, because they're detailing a lot of the things that, that I did for, for Darkroom. Um, but as, um, so as an artist, I'm, I, can, I can kind of sort of start this off with a, a small introduction in, into my own practice because that's been kind of hugely influential in terms of, of how that's dictated my, my teaching practice and, and, and what I do in, in the classroom. Um, but I'm, I'm a quite of a hybrid artist. I, I mean, I've called myself quite like flirtatious or promiscuous with, with cameras. So I, you know, I use it all. I am into film, film stuff, 360 VR, AR, uh, you name it. I just, I live fully in like the image realm. Um, and um, I'm also, I think, very much a kind of a counterfeit artist. So I have called myself also kind of a, a professional uh, forgerer. So I make fakes, I, I make things that are, are simulations or, or things that are 
for example, um, just thinking about like masquerading, for example, is uh, as something that is um, uh, part of the kind of um, world of uh, survival and coping mechanisms for for queer artists, for um, the concepts of Latinidad, and also for um, immigration. Um, where I mean, where I have a whole bunch of tabs here. So this semester, I taught um, a dark room, and and then a, a a kind of a senior seminar for our photography um, uh, upper level um, undergrads. Um, which that one didn't meet at all. And I, I am assuming that maybe most of your interest um, if you're here today is to um, hear a little bit more about dark room. So I'll try and, and talk um, sort of the most about that. Um, going into the fall semester, I was really adamant that I, that I wanted to, to teach silver gelatin processes. Um, and there was a lot of kind of conversations that were happening between myself and then um, my department because um, I was, uh, there was kind of a suggestion that I, that I, that I moved the class towards a more kind of alternative processes course. Um, but I'm also someone who is, is very much a kind of DIY artist. So I really wanted to, um, to think about um, these ways that um, uh, we can think about, you know, adaptation. Um, how do we sort of make a syllabus um, um, starting from this point of, of poverty, right? A poverty of access of materials or, or facilities. Uh, I hear you, Liz. I'm gonna just open, just show you kind of a few things here. So what I ended up doing with this class um, is that I made. Um, we started off with a, a full like VR dark room. Um, so I, I took a 360 camera into VCU's uh, dark room space, um, and this also acted as the um, uh, as a safety quiz. So we ended up kind of, I made a quiz, you know, telling them, hey, where's the lost and found? Where, where, where are the um, air ventilation? Um, I'm dabbing quite a few times in, in here. Uh, there's a million little kind of interactive um, uh, post-its and, and stickers in here. Um, and so this is, this kind of began, kind of uh, started the class for us. Um, I did this also with um, a PhD student. So, you know, it, it, it should, like let's let's not also do a disservice to to all of the, our, our adjuncts and um, kind of contingent faculty out there that really and our staff right um, who who really worked um, tirelessly to make sure that we didn't have any uh, any COVID scares or or any kind of contamination or toxicity that was happening. We did have one COVID scare and that was my fault because I ended up getting sick um, about halfway through the semester. It wasn't COVID. It was just like a flu. Um, but VCU was. Um, pretty professional with it like the, the dark room shut down within um hours of, of me informing uh, my chair and it kind of created this whole sort of domino effect of everything right um and then next the next thing that i did was um i ended up kind of collecting footage um recording myself in the dark room uh, uh doing like demos uh, basically running through the entire class of like what it would have been like if had we had a normal semester um uh, collected all of that footage i had two cameras in there i then set um uh, audio tracks on top of this uh you know and then there was uh, hours and hours of, of editing work that was involved just in, in, in piecing all of this together um and that was was a lot um it was an incredible amount of labor and like when i was doing this and i was telling people that i was doing this people were telling me like you're crazy you're insane for for making something like this um and like towards you know the i think halfway through the semester it was it did get like really exhausting um but the way that i ended up kind of um not not really cutting corners, but sort of making this job a little bit easier on, on myself is that it was what ended up kind of getting posted on Canvas was a um, a collection of um, videos that I had authored and then uh, mixed in with uh, YouTube videos with videos that was already things that were, that were already sort of out there um, that had been made. Um, we and then I I wanted to show just one. I had this video that I thought was. Um, really special just because I had a student and I don't know if, if those of you who attempted to teach dark room or, or a studio class this semester, I don't know if you if you experienced this, but I had a, a student who never stepped foot in the dark room. He was in North Carolina the whole semester. Um, so in a lot of ways, I think I ended up having to uh, build these very kind of tailored approaches to specific students. Um, 
and so this was something that was made yes for for SAC my student who who wasn't in Virginia at the time but also I sort of offered it to the rest of the class as a as a way to tell them that hey you know you you don't need um, an enlarger you don't need a dark room uh, to be able to make silver gelatin prints um, and so this was um, a, a, a short video seven minutes I, I didn't make anything that was longer past probably 12 minutes um, trying to sort of keep mindful of, of um, you know, our students kind of a short attention spans. Um, but I walked them through, again, just um, shooting my bathroom with a 360 camera and talking them through ways and methods of, of creating um, gelatin prints. So I ended up uh, creating this uh, method where I was using my camera's tripod, um, some plexiglass toilet paper as a diffusion mechanism, and then a flashlight. And that was kind of how I ended up making these uh, these prints. Um, and I can show you maybe some examples of these bathroom prints. Um, so this is one of them. Uh, as I mean, as difficult as this work was, I I, I will say that it, it was very just incredibly joyful also to. To, to know that this was something that I could do, right? And that I could, I, I could accomplish. Um, the feedback from the students was also overwhelmingly positive just because they, they liked having um, their own professor's voice talking back to them. Um, and this was something that, again, it was difficult because I knew that there was content that they really needed, but it was already made. Um, so we kind of had to sort of compromise there. Um, and then also I'll say that there was um, a number of students who just couldn't get behind watching videos. Um, as much as I told them like, hey, you know, all of this videos out there, you know, um, I ended up having to do a lot of like one on one, one on one appointments uh, with them. Um, there were probably like two or three students that where it, it really became more of like a, a, a mentorship situation uh, to get them to past this sort of hurdle of, of whatever insecurities or anxieties I had, right, about um, using the darkroom without me. Uh, so my institution won't allow students to have chemicals at home. This was not an issue at VCU unless it is, and I wasn't aware of it, John. I don't know if there's, I don't know if I just skipped certain policies, but I mean, even if- Ask for forgiveness now, but don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in, in the spring, I had a situation where I had a student who, um, went to Florida for spring break and then got stuck there for the semester. So I ended up mailing her like cyanotype chemistry, which later I found, you know, someone told me like, you're not supposed to do that, but you know, let me know and stop me, you know, but um, what else? Um, I mean, I can show you the work that they ended up producing. Um, we, we had two crits, so also our calendar was quite abbreviated in terms of, of just how many projects they had to do. They had a midterm assignment and then a final. For their midterm, they either had to emulate scenes from um, the movie Lighthouse with Willem Dafoe and, and um, Robert Pattinson. If you haven't seen the movie, um, it's about these two men who get stuck in a lighthouse and, and deals a lot with um, you know, the, the anxiety and the, and the lunacy of, of being stuck in a, in, a, in a confined space, right? So I was trying to be like really topical with this. Um, and not a lot of them went for that option. Uh, here's Gabby uh, doing, doing some work um, with that. Um, and then the, the other option that they had, because I, I frequently like, like doing this where I offer assignments and then they can either choose like option A, B or C or they can do everything. Um, the other option is that they could collaborate with me on a project using Randonautica. Randonautica is an app that, um, uh, it's a kind of a pseudoscientific concept here that ostensibly you can use your consciousness to manipulate uh, the app. Uh, you come up with an intent, uh, maybe a, a word in your mind, and the app uh, spits out a, a random set of coordinates, uh, spatial coordinates. So it tells you, you know, walk a thousand meters to find this. Um, this blew up over the summer because there were a group of teenagers in Florida who found um, some body parts on a beach doing this. Um, and so we sort of reshuffled this just, I, I offered it just so that they could have something that made them leave their house. It was a way of kind of connecting um, like new media and parapsychology and all these sort of, you know, sort of mystical things with traditions of like street photography, for example. Um, and so a lot of them, not a lot, not 
all of them sort of chose to participate with me, but a lot of them just used the app to, to do these kind of outdoor um, photography assignments. Did you, have you already said what the name of the app was? Randonautica. Here I can well, type you did. it. Yeah, I can type it in the. Great. Thank um, you. So, you know, I had students who found uh, dilapidated homes. Um, uh, these students, they, they drove out um, about 30 um, minutes outside of Richmond. Um, oh, this is Zach. This is the student who never stepped foot in the dark room. So he did a, this work using an iPad as an enlarger. Great. Um, and then for the final, uh, Sax 102 was really impressive. Um, this is Gabby. Gabby ended up, um, she found something on TikTok um, where you can boil color film uh, in, in a mixture of, of wine and soap. And it creates all of these kind of strange color abstractions. Um, and then she ended up also processing the film herself because all of the labs that she was um, calling and trying to, and to contact to process the film, they wouldn't take it obviously, right? Because it was, it was gunky and it was sticky. So she ended up um, finding a, just a, a color processing kit on Amazon. Uh, that's how she did these. Um, and then Saks, um, here are these other prints that he made. So this is a mixture of like using the iPad as an enlarger, but also doing selective developing with the chemistry. Um, and we'll have some chemograms here. This can just be kind of a show and tell for work. There's a question about how um, they're using the iPad as an enlarger. Right, so it's my, my understanding is that, so you first have to scan the film, that, that image then gets loaded onto the iPad and then you load up the image onto the iPad and then almost contact printed like iPad to silver, silver gelatin paper. And that's why you, you have this sort of effect where I think he was, he was telling me that some of these highlights, all of this kind of like white noise around, this wasn't in the original image that this is perhaps something that's happening when you put the iPad on top of the, of the paper, that it's maybe the pixels of the screen or, or something is kind of creating the, um, this, this sort of, you know, pointily kind of distortion there. Cool. Um, and what else do I have? Uh, let's see. I mean, I can tell. I mean, I can talk to you about seminar unless there's other some questions about dark room. Well, I have a couple a co comments, just things that you've mentioned that I kind of think are are really important. Um, and and particular, I mean, the first thing I wrote down was about staff, even though that's this idea of being grateful for people who are doing a lot of the underlying work. I just, I, I thought that was really important. I really appreciate that you started with that. I mean, I realized for one, I, we have a, a, a tech and I like, I'm going to get off and thank her. I mean, but, um, but just some, some general ideas about the amount of freedom that you seem to have let your students have. And, and you mentioned that she wasn't allowed to ask the students to get chemistry, but, um, but that's just, it was really striking to me when you were talking about that. Um, did you, and you had to work with them individually too. I mean, did you think about that? Was it like a kind of a conscious thing at the beginning? Like I'm gonna, I'm gonna let them go in certain ways or how did you offer this to them? I mean, I had a sort of rough skeleton of, of the options. I knew that I wanted to use Randonautica, that we were, that we were gonna watch Lighthouse. Um, and that's about it. Everything that kind of happened after the fact was really, I think, determined by them um, and just based on, on their, their capabilities. You know, I ended up getting a lot of messages. I mean, we had to slow down the schedule quite a few times. You know, I was getting emails about stress and, and, and anxiety, which I'm sure, you know, yeah. you all kind of experiences too. 
Um, so the syllabus just really had to remain like really adaptable and flexible in, in spite of kind of the, the rough skeleton that I had um, ironed out. It's, it's, I'm very envious of the work that your students made and really, it, it's a I testament. Mean, I, <laughs> I'm envious of them too. I mean, I think like the fact that they're doing this um, sometimes even without like it just it surprised me how they were able to do this without sometimes even talking to me. You know, I did have these people that I had one on one interactions with, but sometimes we, we would have crit and these were students that I hadn't seen at all in person. And then they would just have like prints ready, you know, it's great. So there's some questions. Do you want to talk about a seminar or do you want me to pull up some questions? Um, I can, yeah, there's a few things that I can share with, with um, seminars. So I think as um, you all experience um, throughout the semester, like having readings and having like a, a discussions probably was sort of the easiest to, to handle on Zoom. Um, oh, and I will just to go back, I will, like all of the technical lectures that I built, this was, I looked on, on my hard drive, this was 90 gigs of data. Um, so just to go back to the sentiment about staff, you know, it's like, I, I know that this was a lot of work and it would have been great to have had like collaboration with it, but I, I felt really guilty when I sent my, my darkroom syllabus to um, another adjunct and, I, and, and they, bas they almost like switched gears from their syllabus because because I think that they saw like what I was mm -hmm. doing and out of the, the fear of that, you know, so there is something here to, to just mention about like collaboration and, and what are the kind of like support networks that we have to be able to allow for that, you know, because it would have been great if I had like a video team, a sound edit, you know, all these things, but because that's, that's really kind of like how we can move through this moment is by creating like original content, you know, unique stuff that like, interesting to look at that's like high quality um, and and like get, getting hitting that tier is like it's a lot of work um, what's your thought about sharing that like um, generally speaking or as a as a broader concept not necessarily you specifically but that as a strategy because you did mention that your students don't like you kind of it sounded to me like they really appreciated that made it was made specifically for them mm -hmm. um, do you think a strategy of, of, of pooling these, these videos is a good idea or do you feel like it's important that it was specific for your students? Oh, no, I, I mean, I would love for this to be, um, I, I, at some point I was thinking of offering all of this on YouTube or Vimeo. It was, that'd be great. So, so some of these videos were also borrowed by, um, by Megan, the PhD student who, who helped with the VR darkroom. Um, so once I, I finished videos, I was sending periodic emails to the other people who were teaching the darkroom sections and just telling them that they could use this for their, for their own classes. Um, so it really, I don't, I don't get proprietary with this stuff because that's one of the things that I really dislike about, yeah. I think, academics. It's like when they start holding their secrets, I'm, I'm out. Um, I think, was there a question? Yeah, there's a couple. Was this an advanced class? sophomores okay mm -hmm. and terry terry barrett one would like you at some point to talk about your critiques my critiques um and you're talking to terry barrett so you better get it right <laughs> <laughs> let me see, well let me see what i can say about that just because um the critiques were a challenge i the the, the midterm definitely i you know we had a better time with because I split up the midterm in, in half. It was like, let's talk about just the images alone the first time because they were only scanning their negatives. And then this, like a couple weeks later, we then had a, another kind of midterm crit where we talked about the, the craft of, of printing on silver gels and paper. That first one went better because we were really exclusively looking at, um, at the images. Um, but it was like, but once we got into talking about um, craft and printing, it at that point I think that they were comfortable enough in, in telling them like what they needed and I was telling them you know I was, I was saying please if you have any kind of advice or like if I'm if, if not if I'm not being like fast enough with like videos like let me know um so like someone a couple of them said you know we would like to have some kind of like on-site experience of of looking at prints because it, it was a challenge like once we got into that midterm section of, of talking about printing on paper um 
so we then had a, a final where um, we have an exhibition space here at VCU. Um, so I, I checked out the, a room for a few days. Um, I gave them a, a set of times to submit some photographs, so like uh, some, some prints. And then I installed the, a, a show for them with, with one of my TAs. Um, and then the day of the crit, um, I told them that they needed to go see the, the, the show, the, the exhibition um, in the morning. So they had a, a, couple, a couple of hours on a Monday morning to go in and look at their work on the wall. Um, and that was really fantastic um, in terms of just having them see not just like objects in front of them, but also just seeing their work presented you know, professionally. Um, in terms of like the conversations, I think um, we also, I also gave them, they had a, a group presentation project where they had to, I, I assigned, I put them into groups and then they had to um, uh, do research on, a, on, on thematic content. So we did, um, what were these? It was color abstraction, it was pinholes. And then two groups presented on um, distended identity. So they had to find artists of disability, uh, artists who were thinking about injury. Um, and then Descended Self Part Two was a presentation where they had to find artists um, of um, the of any kind of diaspora, any artists that were dealing with um, uh, negativity, void, uh, madness, and then blackness, like black subjectivity. Um, and that helped a lot. I, I mean, I got comments on, on my evaluations about how the, just the, the group setup sort of helped them along with their research. Um, so I had this, this phenomenal um, like final project for, from two of my, my, my black students. Um, that, let me see if I can, uh, where are you Lightroom? I can show you. So Kalia and Camille both were doing this project around like identity, um, personas, you know, performing in front of the camera. And then I had, and then Camille, um, Camille was really interesting because she uh, picked up a medium format camera uh, towards the end of the semester. Uh, sort of un unprompted again be because the class was was built with so much um, openness and, and flexibility. Um, she, you know, had a, a medium format camera lying around, so she took it upon herself just to um, to move beyond kind of thirty five millimeter, and so she worked on on these uh, set of self portraits. Um, you know, thinking about um, feminine ideas of of a presentation, worth, self image. Um, insecurities and being watched. So we were, I mean, the, we were able to, I think, to mine quite a, quite a bit of content towards the end. Um, so it wasn't, you know, it wasn't absent of, of like, I think, conceptual rigor. Um, I mean, that stuff was, you know, didn't sort of leave the, our arena. Do you, do you, do you think that, that, I mean, in terms of your your conversation about the midterm critique and and when you're looking at images, that that was better than than when you were looking at physical things. Do you do you think that the that the virtual led itself to to like an ability to be more um, conceptual and 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 you know think about that content than because because sometimes in the dark room, you know, we can we can you know get carried away with with the zero double you know double zero five filter and like how they could do this and they're just yeah. different te I mean I could talk about test strips for a class you know so do you think that having having them not there like led to a kind of focus on the on the content that said looking at some of that work like some of it would really be amazing uh, if they had time and attention in the dark room I mean that last portrait project like look like self portrait project really like will will be an amazing project when when it's printed like with with later expertise uh i mean that's i mean to be honest i i i'm, I'm glad you're 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 saying that john because i i thought that the class needed more um more theory that it needed kind of more um exposure of of, of um 
uh, like fine fine artists, you know. Um, but maybe it wasn't, you know. It's it's one of these things where maybe I'm looking looking at how much spent building like all of the kind of technical lectures. I I thought that for the definitely for the first two thirds of the class, it seemed as if most of my attention was just like on on building kind of craftsmanship. Um, but they still kind of like what you know, the other thing that happened was that because it was, it was a class that met two days a week. So we met on, on Zoom one, on Wednesdays and then they were, the other day was just an open darkroom day. Um, and when, whenever we met in person, like we also had readings, you know, I gave them um, uh, Teju Cole. Um, he has this reading on where he's reading Gordon Park's um, images and talking about how, you know, you, you don't always have to make like this beautiful kind of print that has like, Beautiful highlights. So, so maybe you're also seeing kind of the effects of 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 that kind of reading where he's talking about ways of like subverting kind of the, the craft of of the dark room. One thing too, though, and I think this has been true, is uh, I I don't want to say lowering our expectations because I actually feel like it looks to me in your classes too like discoveries have been made in other ways. But I do think a lot of us have been trained a certain way of what what a good print is or what's supposed to happen. And I think that's one part of it. Another part of it is this learning how to, to, to not just compromise, but again, I guess it's different standards and not just specifically about the prints, but really about what a successful class is. And I mean, it sounds to me like you're, you're thinking, you're trying three really hard different things to make happen. And that's actually a lot for a semester you know, to expect mm -hmm. all these things to develop. So I just want to throw that out there because I think it's something everyone who's teaching right now, no matter how, is struggling with. But I think it's also really useful to see ways in which these classes are, I think some of them surpass what happened in the olden days, mm -hmm. I would say. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, because they still got closer. I think we ended class, I, I was, I talked a lot about how happy I was that we were able to to achieve this kind of intimacy, right? In in spite of these circumstances, because I think that the virtual setting, if anything, made those like real life confrontations more special. Um, they also like a lot of them because we reduced the amount of people that could be in the dark room. There were there were people who who would who would be there for for like days at a time, right? Be, because they were able to get a lot more just private time with the facilities um so i i think that these challenges definitely i mean they definitely kind of added maybe like um an obstacle that like that needed to be overcome right it's like they were eager to like get past it and, go ahead john well just to answer uh, the chat oh, john um yes we so we viewed the prints live um and then when class started my ta got on his phone and then he was kind of our, our, our tour. And then I was on a, on a laptop. And then I was guiding Caleb, my TA telling him, hey, can you know, let's go to the next next person. So that's how we, we did that. I just wanna to touch back on what you said, because uh, like Anu earlier, who was, uh, I don't know if you're envious, but you mentioned that you, your students couldn't have chemistry at home. My students got very, very, very short windows to be in the dark room and they could just develop film. So I'm just, I'm envious of that, but I just want to flip that back and say, I mean, it's interesting in how many different approaches there are. It's easy to look at the things like, I, like, oh, if my students could have had that, this would have happened. <laughs> that was just my response to, to you saying that. But um, anyway, that's, yeah, go ahead. Right. Well, I mean, and I think, I mean, my intent, throughout the whole semester was really to like problem solve as, as much as, as possible. I mean, there were, I had students who were very, very resistant with just showing up at all. Um, and that was again, another situation where you, I had to work one-on-one -on -one with them to like hand off materials. You know, I was making myself available at like all kinds of hours that, you know, I was like, Hey, like meet me Friday at this time so that we can, so we can meet outdoors and, and do something. Right. So, um, yeah. So, so Jonathan, um, I mean, I think one of the things that 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 
we're all trying to do. And, you know, I think when I look at your collection of, of VR stuff and, and the kind of effort that the, the kind of time and energy that went into building all of those resources, um, I guess I'm, you know, as somebody who's, who's looking at you as a faculty member that's, you know, going through the TMP process eventually, like, um, how's your research practice been impacted by the kind of work that you've been doing? I think we're all trying to also balance our, our, our work as artists. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I always try and kind of hit two birds with one stone. So if I, like the Randonautica project started because this was like my own project. I had a set of like political terminology that I was trying to find representations of. I was trying to see where the app would take me if I, came up with the word like citizenship or white supremacy or, you know, and so it ended up, um, I mean, it's sometimes it's hard to say like what starts first, whether it's like a teaching idea or if it's like a, a, a studio idea. But at some point for me that it's like they have, they have to breed because they're, my studio does take a hit, you know, because I know how much time I, I, I spend on them. So, I kind of try and take that in, into account with like my studio practice. So, I mean, so next semester, for example, it's like I'm teaching um, two sections of a class called the ethics of deep fakes, um, where I'm having to like teach myself Python, which is, you know, uh, computer language. Um, and so I'm, ha I'm having to resolve a lot of things that I haven't done in my studio practice because the, the class is coming up, right? So I, I, I have to learn it. Um, and it's the same thing with like, you know, my seminar where the, the class is called um, uh, a Critical um, Contemporary Issues in Photography. Um, and so most of the readings um, were coming just from my own sort of research. Um, and I don't know if that's like a, a, a sort of different strategy than what other people have tried, right? But um, yeah, I sort of try and kind of keep keep both kind of talking to each other. Anu has a question. Um, yeah, I, I mean, one thing I would add is um, at my university, I'm on the Dean's uh, Research Advisory Committee and we're putting forth a memo uh, to be more flexible with the research that younger faculty are gonna be able to produce not over just one year, it's gonna have impact over many years. And so, um, so I, I do think some of the senior faculty need to, you know, start advocating for their younger colleagues. And and I'm on faculty senate at VCU, and one of the things that we advocated for, and the and the provost office acquiesced to, was actually sending a letter to all faculty, saying that we know that your research has been impacted by COVID, and giving everybody an, an opportunity to write an impact statement on their research of COVID. Uh, and it came out it came out in a way that like, I think Jonathan was like, oh, another report to write. But but the the goal of it was to make sure that all of the faculty knew that that was an option so that a supervisor, you know, wouldn't keep that information from them. So that is that's becoming a, a practice. So in terms of thinking about where we are as, as faculty at our various institutions, I'm happy to talk to anybody about why we why we're doing that and, and other institutions that are doing that because it's it's something that I mean there's there's anybody that's in 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 this teaching environment is spending so much time in 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 the classroom above and beyond what they what you know it's it's going to impact our research so Were there any other um, solutions suggested or actions I mean, in yeah, from from my pers I mean, that was that was one of the things that we did. But I'm sure that there are other folks, uh, are there other institutions on this on this screen that are that are doing similar things to address that? I think the unfortunate part, Anu, is there also um, uh, just because I my 
former institutions who are also here who are not planning on doing that. I've spoken to two junior faculty at former uh, institutions that I taught at who are being held to exactly the same standards with no, no breaks whatsoever. Um, and it seems incredibly cruel um, to be up against the standards of a, um, you know, a time before COVID. Um, we do have a question from Tom. Um, uh, were you ever physically there when the class was in the dark room? Periodically. So I would make, I would make myself available on Mondays. And then if they wanted to come to talk about anything, I, I was there, but the assumption was that they had already watched the videos. And so if there was anything that needed to happen, um, it would be more from a distance, right? So it'd be like move the enlarger over there or like you're, you, you can find the, the, the processing tank in that bin over there. Um, and this is, so this is also why I, I built it, the dark room. The VR dark room was just to give them a spatial sense of where everything was. Um, so that I, I didn't need to be just working with them um, in, in close proximity. Um, and our limit for the for students, I think it was six plus an instructor, and I don't think we ever we never hit that. I want to loop back uh, to two things that have been mentioned, um, and one is just a further discussion I think about supporting supporting faculty, especially faculty coming up for tenure at some point. Um, I think I wanna put that as maybe a future discussion because I think it's, a, it's really important. And I think it's a function that maybe we can help serve by, by connecting people um, and empowering voices. We talked a little in the spring about it. I'm, some in particular was talking about supporting um, people negotiating uh, for their job. I just want to I just want to put a pin in that, um, and Garen. Also, I just want to say to you that uh, I would like to talk more about that um, about the darkroom experience on the sixth of, of of January. Didn't mean to hijack away back away from you, Jonathan. I just no, wanted to touch no, back I, on that. No, I mean I, I I know that my research has suffered, right? It's like I know that I'm behind. Um, we also lost our research budgets here at VCU, um, so it's 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 been complicated. I I mean I've had to. Um, I mean, in some ways, I'm also just trying to lean into it. So if so, if I don't have a research budget, then fine. Then I'm gonna make things in my bathroom and just be happy with what I what yeah. I get because it it is it is then like I get satisfaction in in, in just not not letting this stop me. And you're providing, I mean, I just, I'm not to sound like a teacher, but you're, it sounds like you're providing a really great experience for your students. And you, you, I mean, the topics, the, the approach, the work that they're doing. So I know that's like hard to put in your tenure dossier, but it's so much more important than the, than a lot of other things that get valued more. Yeah. 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 Can I bring up something related to personal research and you know all the extra work that had to be done? Yes. Um, because our adjunct faculty um, also are really struggling and had to spend time because they were not provided any kind of curriculum for teaching online. Um, had to spend their time unpaid over the summer to design courses without the guarantee of actually even teaching that course. Um, so th I think that's something that we can't lose sight of when we know that there's actually more people teaching as adjuncts or part-time or contingent faculty um, in our universities than tenured faculty. Yeah, I mean, we have adjuncts that are not coming back for the spring because of this reason. Anyway, so I would add that, uh, sorry, I would just add that that's a role full-time faculty can play in terms of advocating for um, our part-time faculty. Uh, for our online training, our part-time faculty actually got paid uh, for the training so that uh, there was some kind of compensation, but that was brought up um, through the full-time faculty. faculty. And, and I'll throw this out there um, because it's been really interesting for me to learn the differences between 
the state I just came from to the state I now live in. There are different um, uh, state and federal regulations regarding um, uh, adjuncts and, um, for example, meetings, and that uh, in some states they must be compensated um, for any meetings that they are required to attend. But because the academic environment is one where we um, praise those who say yes all the time and we um, we always um, uh, sort of accept the idea that we'll spend more time for our students. We um, are perpetuating a culture that um, takes advantage um, of um, our resources, our time, et cetera. And I'm saying that here as a dean who is trying to find a way to, um, uh, you know, compensate my faculty when they're called into a meeting, um, uh, who is trying to find a way to raise the salaries of my adjunct faculty. Um, it, you know, there are mechanisms that are in place for us to to point to. Um, and, um, and again, as John has said, I encourage us all to remember that we are a community and that we have um, the, you know, we have multiple means of, of getting into Touch with one another and helping um, each other to advocate um, for one another. Um, because I, you know, as I think most of us who have come through the recession, um, who have come through different moments in academic, um, um, you know, sort of histories, know that the austere, austerity measures that are going to be in place are going to be in place for quite some time to come, and we won't gain back um, the some of the. Um, some of the, uh, you know, research uh, opportunities and um, professional practice opportunities um, that we fought so hard to to get. Um, so, um, yeah, I think, you know, Photofica continues to try and um, be uh, relevant and useful in this particular time. Um, and it's certainly another one of those places where we can we can assist. I just wanted to to tag on to that and what what Edgar said when he talked yeah. about about preparing for the apocalypse uh, being survivalist that community is going to be the skill that that and not to you know toot our own horns but I do think like like making sure that we're in touch with each other and um, again another further discussion about ways in which John was mentioning that that FERPA uh, embedded in FERPA are ways to reduce students' ability to communicate with each other. And I just, I'm just a way of, of, of comparing. I mean, I actually teach in two different states, radically different states, Arizona and Massachusetts. And everything you say, I get paid twice as much in, in Massachusetts. I get paid to go to meetings. My, as an adjunct, I have some ways I have more rights than I did as a tenured professor at ASU. It's kind of weird, so. But the more we can compare with each other, I think, and not in a negative way, but I think back to some other ideas, um, I think we can help make things stronger. So, so Deborah, in the in the in the kind of final minute that we have here, is uh, asking about sharing tutorials, and we definitely we definitely have. Um, Kind of a a resource section and and uh, project examples and such on the on the site, but I'm I'm wondering, uh, Jonathan, you don't have to say yes now, but maybe uh, we can make a page for you with some of your darkroom information, if that would be uh, if it would be amenable to you, because it'd be great to share that with uh, with our viewers. Yeah, I think I mean um, you know I'm hosting everything right now in Cultura, which is a different kind of video platform. I don't know if if y'all have it on. Um, with your school accounts, but if it's public, yeah, I, I, I will just share the links. I'll figure, we'll figure out a way to make it so that uh, at least some of the stuff is viewable and people want to know your Instagram handle. I'm typing it right now. It's Pupusa Hands. And uh, are there any other final questions? Because we're, we're, we're right at time and we, and Anne likes to enforce a, a clear five, five o'clock so we can get out of here, but uh, I just want to thank everybody for being with us this entire year. It's been a real, um, it's been a real experience for 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 me and for Anne and for Betsy, and uh, it's been uh, been really great to see familiar faces and 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 meet some new people, uh, and and see you keep coming back. So thank you all for for coming and and uh, have a great new year and and great holiday season. 
Yes, happy holidays to all, um, as strange as they will be, and happy new year. And again, thank you so much for being here. Um, we really appreciate it. Jonathan, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks Jonathan. for having me. Yeah, Thanks. thank you so much, Jonathan. Not that you had to, another thing that you had to do as junior <laughs> faculty, but it was great right. for us to see what you've been working on. It's been helpful. Oh, you're so generous. Thank, thank you. you. It was great sharing. Thanks for the questions.